Welcome to Caltrans LSIP LS exam preparation course. 1A is the preparation for California license examinations. A word of caution, don't use this course as your only preparation. Devise and follow a regular schedule of study which begins months before the test. What many problems in each area, not just those in this course's workbook, but problems from other sources as well. This course is funded by Caltrans, but you and I owe a profound thanks to others, the course's instructors, from the academic community, the private sector, other public agencies, and from Caltrans as well. We wish you well in your study toward becoming a member of California's professional land surveying community. Hello, I'm Russ Forsberg. I'm a licensed land surveyor in the state of California. My number is LS4213. I am a semi-retired Caltrans land surveyor currently involved with the Caltrans training class known as the Trilogy. My land surveying experience with Caltrans was about equally divided between surveys and right-of-way engineering. While I was in right-of-way engineering, I had charge of a squad that did nothing but write legal descriptions. That brought me into constant touch with right-of-way agents, attorneys, title company personnel, as well as surveyors. I have also had some experience in the private sector, where I did a few parcel maps and some other small surveys. I'm going to talk to you about legal descriptions. A legal description is a word picture that actually and accurately describes a parcel of land. The late Gurdon Waddles, in his excellent book, Writing Legal Descriptions, says the following about them. A description of the outline of a certain area is the proper grouping of words that delineates one specific piece of land and which cannot apply to any other piece of land, although the definition is correctly stated as land description, it is generally called legal because it must stand up under the law and litigation. A typical description usually includes preamble or caption, the body, and qualifying or augmenting clauses. The first two are sometimes combined in one short paragraph. There are frequently no qualifying or augmenting clauses needed. A good legal description has the following characteristics. It's capable of only one interpretation. It's short but clear. It's surveyable. It's legal. And it's insurable. Let's take a look at these points one at a time capable of only one interpretation. All of us use words in ordinary conversation that have vastly different meanings to different people. Words like mostly, somewhat, generally, and so forth are vague. For instance, what does generally mean? Does it mean 50% of the time, 75% of the time, or something else? Words like this have their place in in general conversation, but do not fit in legal descriptions. Terms like more or less are sometimes found in legal descriptions, but they are always accompanied by another more precise statement that is intended to control. Knowledgeable people in the fields of land surveying and title work must agree on the interpretation. If there is disagreement among professionals as to the meaning of words or techniques used, the writer must look for a different way of saying what he or she wanted to say. You may have your own pet way of saying something, and it may even stand up in court. But if other professionals in the field are divided in their interpretations of what you said, you really ought to change your style and technique in a way that will result in descriptions that are capable of only one interpretation. Short. The description should be short, consistent with clarity. 
clarity must not be sacrificed for brevity, however. It must clearly describe the parcel, but on the other hand, unnecessary language must be avoided. After all, the more wordy a document is, the more chances there are for error. Surveyable. It must be surveyable. The surveyor begins with monuments on the ground. If there are none at all on the perimeter of the subject parcel, the surveyor must find monuments somewhere and work his or her way into the parcel. That means that proper writing techniques must be used to make sure that the description will be oriented in the correct manner so that the parcel can be marked out on the ground where the writer intended. That can be done if the writer is familiar with the proven techniques that are available to us. It is particularly important that descriptions that include free line calls or new property lines be written in such a way that the new lines can be surveyed and monumented with confidence, with no chance of someone later proving that the line should be placed in another position. There are a number of techniques available that can assist in reaching this goal. We'll examine some shortly. Legal. It must be able to stand the test in court if necessary. In other words, the writer must use words and techniques in the way in which a court of law will understand them. There is frequently a great difference between the legal definition of a word and the general public's understanding of what it means. And the writer must be aware of the differences. Insurable. Title companies issue insurance on description, stating, among other things, that it does not conflict with descriptions of adjoining parcels. If title company personnel think that a description is poorly written and may not be able to stand a legal test in court, they are not likely to insure it. That insurability standard is a higher standard than just being legal. The title person is not likely to ensure the description unless it is clearly legal and not borderline. Writers who are really successful invariably have certain basic qualifications. They usually, one, understand boundary determination principles, two, understand the legal meaning of words used, and three, understand accepted writing techniques. Let's take a look at them one at a time. Number one, understand boundary determination principles. It is impossible to be a good description writer without a good understanding of boundary determination principles. It is not uncommon to find two or more monuments, each purporting to mark the location of one corner. The writer must be in the habit of checking the pedigree of each monument found. If the pedigree is good, it can be traced back to the original monument. If some kind of monument is found somewhere near where the corner is thought to be, but the monument cannot be traced back to the original, the writer really doesn't know where the corner is. The writer must recognize and accept that fact and use a technique that will allow for it. Number two, understand the legal meaning of words used. Any description may end up in court at some time. If and when it does, the court will interpret it based on the legally accepted definitions of words used, whether the writer understood them that way or not. Get in the habit of looking up words in the dictionary. And please don't use a dime store dictionary. Use a good legal dictionary like Black's Law Dictionary or the title handbook. You'll find reference to them in your workbook. Number three, understand accepted writing techniques. In communicating with any group, the writer or speaker must understand the language and thinking of his or her listeners. 
One goal of the person writing legal descriptions is to convince his or her fellow professionals. Those professionals have developed a language and certain writing techniques all their own. It is vital that we understand them and learn to use them. Descriptions we write will be more readily accepted by them if we use procedures and techniques they are familiar with. Now, the writer's frame of mind. Write as though three people representing three different professions were looking over your shoulder. Those three are, one, the surveyor, two, the title person, and three, the judge. Each has a unique, special interest in the description. Now let's take a look at each of these points of view. One, the surveyor is interested in a place to start in the field, a way to orient the bearings in the description, and enough information to allow him or her to calculate a traverse to it and to stake it out in the field. The typical surveyor is intensely interested in the problem of locating the parcel on the ground but is frequently not well acquainted with the title person's problems and concerns. Number two, the title person is concerned with ensuring the description and therefore watches closely the calls to and along existing property lines. The typical title person knows little about surveying but is very concerned about the description's relationship to adjoining parcels. The error the typical surveyor is likely to make is failing to make appropriate title calls. Number three, the judge, of course, is interested in the bottom line. Will it stand the test in court? The judge is also keenly aware of the exact legal meaning of the words used in the description. And here again, the average surveyor has a tendency to use terms without understanding clearly how a court of law may understand them. Do yourself a favor and get in the habit of using the same dictionary the judge uses. You'll find a list of terms in your workbook that are encountered in legal descriptions. They should be studied and understood thoroughly. Again, the book you use should include the ones you'll find in the recommended reading in your workbook. Special attention should be given to words like pedigree and have. We have already talked about pedigree. The word have has two different meanings depending on how it is used. Under state rules, half means area. But if federal rules are to be followed, the word means dividing the sideline dimensions in half and then connecting the midpoints. That rarely results in half by area. Half in a description in California means area unless the description includes language that clearly indicates that the intent is to use federal rules such as a reference to a U.S. government survey. Either is a commonly abused word. It means on one side or the other. And that is almost never what the description writer wants to say. Beginners sometimes describe a strip of land by saying, a strip of land 20 feet wide lying 10 feet on either side of the following described line. That statement describes a 10 foot wide strip on one side or on the other of the described line. The word should be each and not either. It's hard to imagine the word either ever fitting in a legal description. Adjacent, adjoining, and contiguous should be understood also. An easement that touches the property of a line along its entire length is said to be adjoining, whereas an easement that touches the property line for part of its length and for the rest of the length is close to 
but not touching is said to be adjacent. Adjoining or adjacent would describe that portion that touches the property line, but adjacent is the only word that describes that portion of the easement that is close to but not touching the property line. Learn what the various authorities say about the word contiguous, and you will agree that it is an ambiguous term. It should be avoided in legal descriptions. Accepting and reserving are sometimes used as though they were synonymous. They are not. Accept or accepting have the effect of subtracting something from the parcel just described. A description that describes a three-acre parcel and then accepts one acre conveys two acres. The acre described in the exception was taken back or removed from the three acres initially described. Reserve or reserving creates a new right, like an easement, for instance, in favor of the grantor. A deed may describe three acres and then reserve to the grantor a 40-foot easement along the east property line for ingress and egress to serve another parcel owned by the grantor. The deed still conveys three acres to the grantee, but creates an easement over the three acres in favor of the grantor. The grantor did not need the easement before because he or she owned the entire parcel. You will find in your workbook a set of miscellaneous clauses designed to help you handle certain standard situations. Each is a standard grouping of words that have been found to work well for describing certain lines like curves, parallel lines, calls to street sidelines, strips, and so forth. You may as well use these same standard statements. It is simply not necessary or wise to spend precious time trying to invent a way of saying certain things when experienced professionals have spent years perfecting the way to say it. Don't try to compose them from scratch while you are taking the test. And don't try to memorize them. There are simply too many. Rather, Index a number of samples from this and other sources so you can turn to them quickly and find the sample that is close to what you need. Then modify it to fit your situation. That's much easier and a whole lot safer. You'll find other samples of handy ways of saying certain things in the books listed under recommended reading, particularly Mr. Waddle's book, Writing Legal Descriptions, which we have already mentioned. Concentrate on getting acquainted with the samples that are available and where and how to find them in a hurry. That will make your work much easier. Now let's go back to the basic outline of a description and take a look at the three components in some detail. The preamble or caption describes the larger parcel out of which the subject parcel is cut. It serves to bring the reader's attention to focus on the immediate surroundings. As such, it includes state, county, city, if any, an existing subdivision such as section, township, and range and meridian, or lot, block, and tract. It will include the names of the grantor and the grantee and will normally indicate the degree of title conveyed. For instance, the term grant to, with no qualifying language, conveys fee. Whereas the statement grant to John Jones an, e an easement for ingress and egress in and to would grant an easement for that purpose. There is an exception to what I have said, and that is a quick claim deed. The word the word grantor, grantee, grant to, and such do not appear in a quick claim deed. And instead of stating the exact title conveyed, it will use words like quick claim or remise, release, and quick claim. A quick claim deed releases whatever interest the signer had, if any. 
The preamble may include words that limit the conveyance, such as that portion of Lot 7, etc., included within a strip of land. The described strip may extend far beyond the borders of Lot 7, but the only portion conveyed will be the portion of the strip that falls within Lot 7. The preamble may indicate the type of description that follows, such as a line description or a strip description. Now the body of the description. This is where the particulars of the description are found. Most people, when thinking of legal descriptions, think in terms of meets and bounds descriptions, where the description begins at a point on the perimeter of the parcel and then gives a series of bearings and distances around the parcel. Back to the point of beginning. A great many descriptions are written that way, but there are a number of other types that are really variations on this basic technique. We'll see some examples of these different types shortly. The term meets and bounds means measurements and boundaries. The bearings and distances constitute the meets, and the bounds or boundaries consist of the title calls that are made throughout the description. It's obvious that a description must close mathematically. A typical meets and bounds description says that it returns to the point of beginning. If the bearings and distances do not return the reader to the point of beginning, everyone knows that a mistake has been made. The description may even be void for want of certainty. It's a good idea to run a traverse through a meets and bounds description once it is written. It will not help you with title calls, but it is indeed a very good feeling to know that the description closes. Courses are the statements used to describe the straight and curved lines that make up the boundary of a parcel. The simple course and the one most of us are familiar with is the uncomplicated straight line. Here are two of them. Then south 60 degrees east 65.00 feet, then north 40 degrees east, 100.00 feet. The word dense is the right word to use in this situation because it means, in effect, continuing from the previous course. The reader is told to traverse in the direction south 60 degrees east for a distance of 65 feet. The reader is then told to continue from that point north 40 degrees east for a distance of 100 feet. Comparing the two bearings gives the deflection angle between the two courses. In this case, it would be 80 degrees. The reader needs that deflection angle in order to plot it in the office or to stake it out in the field. Now let's take a look at a description of the tangent curve that follows those two courses. Thence easterly along a tangent curve to the right <clears throat> having a radius of 50 feet through a central angle of 80 degrees and arc distance of 69.81 feet. <clears throat> the statement describes the curve and its relationship to the previous course. The word tangent defines the curve as being tangent to the previous course. In other words, the radial line to the point where the curve begins is at right angles to the previous course. The term to the right means that a person walking the line would curve to the right when walking from the straight line into the curve. Radius, delta, and length of curve are all given, although only two are needed to set the curve. The third is given for a check. Note that the term arc distance is used to describe the length of curve to make sure that the reader does not assume that the distance should be measured along the cord. The technique we have just described is called the tangent method of describing the curve that is tangent to the previous course. Because it sets the curve relative to a tangent line, that passes through the beginning of the curve. 
Some prefer another method called the concave method, which uses the direction of concavity of the curve itself as well as the bearing of the radial line to the point where the curve begins. What do we mean by direction of concavity? Well, picture yourself at the midpoint of the curve and facing the radius point of the curve. That is, the center of the circle of which the curve is a part. You are then looking in the direction of concavity. Here is how the same curve would be described using the concave method. To a tangent curve, concave southerly and having a radius of 50.00 feet. Then easterly along said curve through a central angle of 80 degrees and arc distance of 69.81 feet. In this drawing, we see a curve that is not tangent to the previous course. This is a different situation because the writer must give enough information and do it clearly enough so that the reader can run a traverse through the description without looking at a map. Let's use both, method, both, both methods to describe this non-tangent curve. First, the tangent method. North, 40 degrees east, 100.00 feet to a non-tangent curve. Then, from a tangent that bears north 60 degrees east, easterly along a curve to the right, having a radius of 50.00 feet to a central angle of 80 degrees and arc distance of 69.81 feet. This description starts right off by saying that the curve is not tangent. However, if readers are to calculate traverses through the description or walk through it in the field, they will need to be oriented in the correct direction to set the curve. Therefore, the next statement says, from a tangent that bears north 60 degrees east. That instructs readers to face north 60 degrees east instead of north 40 degrees east, as they would have faced if the curve were tangent to the previous course. The rest of the description proceeds the same as if the curve were tangent. Now let's take a look at the concave method. To the beginning of a non-tangent curve, concave southerly and having a radius of 50.00 feet, to which beginning of curve a radial line bears north 30 degrees west, thence easterly along said curve through a central angle of 80 degrees and arc distance of 69.81 feet. The unique feature that has been added to this description is the statement to which beginning of curve a radial line bears north 30 degrees west. This gives the reader the direction to go to reach the radius point of the curve. When the radius, delta, and length are given later, as well as the direction of travel, the picture is complete. Note that the radial bearing given is north 30 degrees west and not south 30 degrees east. A radial line radiates in one direction from the radius point to the point on the curve and not beyond. A prolongation of a radial line is described as just that, a prolongation of a radial line. In the drawing now on the screen, we see a parcel consisting of five courses, all of them straight lines. Two of them are tidal lines in this case, section lines. That means they are lines that exist on recorded maps or documents and are locatable on the ground. The description must call along each of these lines to make sure that it does not overlap the line and encroach on adjoining property. Each of these two courses must include two statements. First, a bearing and distance and second, a specific call along the section line. Certain bearings and or distances in the description 
must yield if necessary in order that the description will run along the section lines. The other three courses describe free lines. That simply means that they are free of existing title lines. Admittedly, some of them are more free than others. For instance, line BC is tied to the section line at B, and line DE is connected to the section line at E. But the lines themselves are free. They do not coincide with existing title lines. They are new property lines created by this description. Let's assume that the description begins at the section corner and goes clockwise around the parcel. The person reading the description traces it out either on paper or on the ground by using the angles of intersection shown at B, C, D, and E. Each angle, <coughs> each angle of intersection is derived by comparing the bearings of the two adjoining courses. <coughs> Those shown at B, C, and D are unchallenged, but the angle of intersection at E must yield if necessary to match the true direction of the east line of the section. That means trouble later on, as we'll soon see. In a description reading clockwise around the parcel, the course from D to E will include, of course, a bearing and a distance, but it must also include a call to the east line of said section. That call must be made because the section line is the property line. <coughs> that tells the reader that the intent is to reach the east line even if the distance just given must yield. Incidentally, if the course from D to E gave a bearing and a distance and added the statement to a point on the east line of said section distant northerly along said east line 1214 feet from the southeast corner of said section both the bearing and the distance given would have to yield if necessary that is not just a call to a line but a call to a specific point on the line and that call must be honored Likewise, the call may have given a bearing and distance and the statement to the southeast corner of said section. Here again, the bearing and distance would both have to yield if necessary, and the description would run directly to the section corner. The course from E to the section corner should include a bearing and distance along with a call along said section line to the section corner, or to the point of beginning. In this case, both the bearing and the distance may have to yield. Note that using the bearings and distances alone, and ignoring the title calls to and along the east line of the section, may place this course in a location other than on the true east line of the section. Free lines must be described in such a way that they are surveyable. That means that they must be based on the strongest possible evidence, which usually means that the free line call should be established early in the description. If this description were written in a counterclockwise direction, starting at the section corner, the free line calls would immediately follow the call along the east line of the section and be set relative to the location of that east line. However, the location of that east line is insecure. Clockwise is the direction to go in this case. Now the point of beginning. The description must have a point of beginning that is a locatable record point or reference to one. Let's take a look at some possible choices in the drawing now on the screen. The preamble would read like this. That portion of Lot 2, Block B, Tract 1124 in the City of, County of, State of California, according to maps recorded in Book 100, pages 16 and 17 of maps in the Office of the County Recorder of said county, 
described as follows. Then would follow the body of the description which begins by describing the point of beginning. The one way to describe the highlighted portion of lot 2 is to establish the point of beginning at A and then run clockwise around the parcel. That version would begin by saying beginning at the southwest corner of said lot 2. Another version would be to begin the description at B, reference to the northwest corner of lot 2. It might read like this. Beginning at a point on the west line of said lot 2, distant thereon south 1 degree west, 100.00 feet from the northwest corner of said lot 2. Note that the statement, distance thereon, south 1 degree west, 100.00 feet from the northwest corner of said lot 2 is a kind of parenthetical statement that simply gives the exact location of the point of beginning. Note also that we reference the point of beginning to only one lot corner and not to two. It would be tempting to describe the point of beginning as being 100 feet from the northwest corner of lot 2 and 20 feet from the southwest corner of lot 2. That, however, would be a double call. If a later survey shows that the true length of the west line of the lot is longer or shorter than 120 feet, the reader is forced to decide which one to use or whether to prorate the difference. Double calls are ambiguous and should be avoided. A third way of doing this would be to commence at G and establish a true point of beginning at B. We see this method highlighted on the screen now. It might read like this. Commencing at the northwest corner of lot 1 of said track 1124, thence along the west line of said lot, south 1 degree west, 105.00 feet, then north 88 degrees east, 66.00 feet to the west line of said lot 2 and the true point of beginning. The conveyance, begin, the conveyance begins at the true point of beginning. The line from the point of commencement to the true point of beginning is simply a means of locating and orienting the description. relative to a secure line that can be located on the ground. This technique establishes the basis of bearings on the west line of lot 1 instead of the west line of lot 2. There may actually be several courses between the point of commencement and the true point of beginning, depending on the nature of the parcel. If the description then runs clockwise around the parcel, from the true point of beginning, the free line call, DC, is based on the west line of lot 1, which is an advantage if the location of the lot lines for lot 2 are in doubt. That would not seem to be a problem in a subdivision like that shown in this drawing. However, it's easy to picture more complex parcels where this principle might apply. When looking for the best point to use the point of be to use for the point of beginning, be sure to check the pedigree of each corner to see which one is strong enough to use without fear that its location can be proven wrong. Remember that a found monument does not mean that the location of that corner is secure unless the monument is an original or its pedigree is such that it can be traced back to the original. If such a corner cannot be found, the writer should consider a type of description that will permit free line calls to be tied to sound points outside the parcel. The writer must establish a sound basis of bearings based on points and lines whose location is secure. The figure on the screen presents two choices for a basis of bearings, the south line of the section and the east line. The south line is chosen because the two monuments that control the line are original and unlikely to be successfully challenged. The east quarter corner is calculated 
which means that someone may later prove our, our location wrong. A basis of bearings assigns a bearing to a line whose location is known so that that relationship may be used to orient the rest of the description. Different maps and deeds may use different bearings for the same tidal line. This is a place where mistakes are easily made. For instance, it is easy to convince ourselves that once the point of beginning, in this case the southeast corner of the section, is described, all we need to do is say westerly along the south line of the section 800 feet or whatever distance was needed and then continue around the parcel. The direction of the section line, after all, is determined by the monuments and not by the bearing we may assign to it. The reader could find the point of beginning and traverse westerly along the section line to 800 feet. But then the reader is stuck. With no bearing given for the section line, the reader has no way of calculating the angle of intersection to turn off the section line to give direction to the next course. The person taking out the description in the field needs those angles of intersection between courses, and they are obtained by comparing the bearings of the adjoining courses as they appear in the description. Beware of the second basis of bearings, however. A second basis of bearings is established as shown in the figure on, now on the screen when a call is made to and then along a tidal line in the body of the description. And the true location of that tidal line is different from that indicated by the bearing used in the description. In other words, the relationship between the line and the bearing assigned to it is different from that established in the initial intended basis of bearings. In this drawing, the point of beginning and the basis of bearings are properly established along the one secure line. However, a call is made along the east line of the section which is not secure. If that line is not where the writers thought it was, a new basis of bearings has been established. Assume for the moment that the corridor we see crossing this section continues on into the uh, next section to the east. Suppose also that the description for the parcel to the east uses the insecure section line for a basis of bearing. The two descriptions will fit neatly together only if the section line is exactly where the writer thought it was. The distance between the section corner and the point where the north line of the corridor crosses the section line would be exactly the same in each description. If, however, the section line is really found to be in a different place, the distance between the section from the section corner to the north line of the corridor will be different in the two descriptions. In other words, there will be an unintended jog in the northerly line of the corridor. This drawing shows the difference between the calculated position for the east line of the section and the true line as determined by a later survey. What portion of the area between the calculated and the true line actually conveys? Do we prolong A, B to C? Do we go at right angles to the calculated line from B to D? Or do we go at right angles to the true line from B to E? Prolonging the, the line A, B to C is the probable answer. Remember that if one bearing or one distance has to yield, the traverse will no longer close mathematically. Yet the description will clearly convey to the section line wherever it is found to be. The challenge is to write a description that will convey to the section line and at the same time make sure that the free lines are definitely set relative to the sound basis of bearings. In this case, the south line of the section. There are a number of ways of accomplishing that goal. We'll see a couple of them shortly. The next course is along the section line, which is now the true line and not the calculated one. 
The course that follows this one presents a problem. We see here that the angle of intersection at the point where the description leaves the true line results in a direction for the succeeding course that is different from that intended by the writer. A different technique is needed to enable the writer to describe the free lines that follow in a more secure fashion. We are presented with a challenge when a call for a free line follows a call along a line whose location is somewhat uncertain as we see here. The best answer in this case would be a different type of description, such as an exception or inclusive description. More about that later. Clauses are separate statements that are normally added after the body of the description. Their purpose is to qualify or augment what has been said thus far. A clause may state the area of the parcel described or may state where a basis of bearings is intended to be. Another one that is used in strip descriptions to clarify where the sidelines of the strip are to terminate reads like this. The sidelines of said strip shall be prolonged or shortened so as to terminate at the east line of said property. A clause may be needed to reserve a right such as an, in, an easement for ingress and egress. A reservation, remember, creates a new right which the grantor will retain when the fee is conveyed to the grantee. Augmenting clauses add something to what has been described, such as the means of access to the parcel described. Another would be a statement indicating what portion of the underlying fee in the adjoining street is intended to be conveyed. You will find samples of these and other clauses in your workbook. Now we'll talk about the different types of descriptions. There are really different techniques that are available for us to use depending on the need. Think of them as a toolbox full of tools to use on the job. Sectionalized land refers to land that was subdivided by the federal government while it was in public domain. The land was surveyed in accordance with federal law, and plots of those surveys were prepared for use in identifying the land and to aid in conveying it to private parties and various government agencies. However, the plots were based on the survey and dependent on it. The location of the original monuments constitute the final proof of the size, shape, and location of a given parcel, even though the size and shape may be considerably different from that shown on the plat. Descriptions in sectionalized land contain the section in which the parcel is located, the township. which tells how far north or south of the initial point the parcel is, the range, which tells how far east or west of the initial point the parcel is, the meridian, which identifies the initial point and the meridian passing through it, the official flat, including the approval date, city, if any, county, and state. There are three initial points in the state of California. Their locations were chosen arbitrarily by the original government surveyor. You see their general location on the screen now. Every sectionalized land description in the state is referenced to one of these three points. Let's take a, look, a closer look at one of them. The highlighted square is called a township and it is described as being Township 3 South, Range 3 West, commonly abbreviated T3SR3W. That means that it is located three townships south of the initial point and three west of it. A description of this township would read, Township 3 South, Range 3 West, San Bernardino Meridian, or Mount Diablo or Humboldt Meridian, in the city of if any, the county of, state of California, according to official plan thereof, approved and the approval date. The approval date of the official plan is important. 
There may be a number of plants, and it is important to be clear which one we are referring to. There would be an original plant, there may be a later independent resurvey, and following that a dependent resurvey, and there may even be a corrective dependent resurvey. Description writing problems in the LS exam may not furnish an approval date. In that case, you will have to accept what they give you and ignore the date. Each normal township is broken down further in the following manner. A normal township contains 36 sections numbered beginning at the northeast corner of the township and running westerly across the township then south one tier, and then easterly across the township, and so forth until 36 is, is reached at the southeast corner. If we highlight certain digits, we will notice an interesting sequence that should make it easier to remember which sections are on the perimeter of the township. Note the sequence of the numbers highlighted in blue, beginning at section 1. First clockwise along the east side, then counterclockwise, beginning again at section 1. Then, remembering the direction in which the sections are numbered, as indicated by the yellow arrows on the screen, it's an easy matter to number all of the sections. Section 22 is highlighted on the screen. The description of the township we have just talked about can be easily adapted to describe section 22 by simply adding it to the description, usually in front of it. Here we have a closer look at the southwest quarter of section 22, broken into adequate parts with the northeast quarter of the southwest quarter highlighted. We can easily expand our description further to describe only this highlighted area. It would read, the northeast quarter of the southwest quarter of section 22, township 3 south, range 3 west, San Bernardino Meridian, in the city of, county of, state of California, according to official plans thereof approved and the approval date. Remember that the easy way to read a description like this, or to write one for that matter, is to read or write it backwards. That description will locate that particular parcel with reference to the San Bernardino initial point. It is unique in that it will describe only one parcel although a good deal of surveying would be necessary to mark it out in the field. The excess and deficiency resulting from the survey of the interior of the township was placed in the sections along the north and west lines of the township. This resulted in portions of those sections being other than the intended size and shape. They were assigned lot numbers. A description of one of these would read, Lot 3 in the northwest quarter of section 3 instead of the northeast quarter of the northwest quarter of section 3. Perhaps the simplest description of all is the map reference description. It describes a parcel as shown on a particular map. Calling for that map has the effect of incorporating that entire map if necessary into the description just as if it were printed on the face of the document. Anything on the map may be used to locate the parcel on the ground. Descriptions of this kind are short and easy to write. This one would read, Lot 1, Lot The Office of the County Recorder of said county. Note that in this description, the preamble and body are combined in one statement. One advantage in a description like this is that it is short and easy to write. It also gives the reader the authority to use the entire map if necessary to locate the parcel. One disadvantage is the fact that the description does not give the reader a picture of the size and shape of the parcel. The reader must have the map to see that. Another disadvantage is the fact that if the lot number or the block designation were incorrect, the result would be disastrous. 
Now we've about reached the halfway point in our presentation, so let's take a short break. 